I learned a new sound, a more horrible sound than description can picture. It was the thud of a speeding, living body on a stone sidewalk. Thud dead, thud dead, thud dead, thud dead. 62 thud deads. This is a quote from William Shepard, a witness of the tragic Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. On March 25, 1911, 146 young immigrants died, trapped or jumping from the burning building. That day was the turning point in changing the American laws on keeping workers safe and healthy. The event played a part in a larger movement to help countless other workers in the future to have better working conditions. However, this came at a great cost to so many young women. The tragedy of lives lost touched many people, but it ended in triumph for the American workforce. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was a sweatshop, an example of the growing number of working women, but their interests were not cared for. The bosses, Harris and Blanc, whose only goal was to make money, hired desperate immigrant girls who worked long hours, received low wages, and had to purchase their own supplies. They worked in unsanitary and dangerous workplace environments. When the neglect became too much, revolts and strikes ensued. These unsuccessful attempts to change working conditions left some women unemployed, while the rest suffered wage cuts and elongated hours. To make the situation worse, the building codes in New York were lenient and substandard. They required doors to be opened outwards and to be opened during work hours. However, the doors of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory were locked during work hours to keep women working for the allotted hours. In addition, the structure took advantage of the careless codes, which stated that buildings over 150 feet must have metal trim, metal window frames, and stone or concrete floors. The Triangle Factory was 90 feet tall, with wood trim, wood window frames, and wood flooring, all easily flammable. They didn't even have sprinklers or fire drills. Saturday, March 25th, 1911, started as any other day. The clear blue skies combined with the cool, clean air that cut through New York City was a nice contrast from the previous dreary winter days. Families took strolls through the city and its parks, children played on the grass, and factory workers made their ways to the factories. No one was aware of the tragedy that would occur later that day. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory building was situated on the corner of Washington and Green Street. There were only two exits, and each of them were halfway down the block. On the eighth floor, there were seven long cutting tables, each with boards that surrounded the legs of the tables to create a large bin. This bin allowed for the cutters to throw out any scraps from the fabric they worked with. Almost everything on the floor was flammable, fabric, paper, and the wooden tables. The only non-flammable object within close proximity were the steel edges surrounding the tissue paper patterns. On the eighth floor, as one of the cutters was taking his coat and hat off a peg, he noticed a fire in his scrap bin. It was most likely caused by the last glowing embers of a cigarette, which had been thrown in the bin before it was completely extinguished. Cotton, compared to paper, was extremely flammable. Within seconds, the fire grew exponentially and suffocated the air around it. The workers around the fire grabbed the little red fire pails in an attempt to extinguish the fire, but it made no difference. The fire had started. Inside the factory, even more chaos was rising. In each stairwell on every floor, there was a fire hose with a valve beside it to activate the water from a tank on the roof. Employees attempted to turn on the hoses to put out the flames, but to no avail. There was no pressure, and there was no water. Workers flooded to the doors in attempts to escape. People shoved each other to escape to the stairs down to Green Street, those who didn't choose the stairs crowded the elevators to Washington Place. The elevators, as a result of the mass amount of workers attempting to flee the burning room, crowded and failed. Twenty-five bodies were found in the shaft. Still others rushed towards the tiny fire escape situated at the rear end of the building. However, the fire escape didn't reach the ground and caved under the weight of people. Some people were even less lucky. 
the doors as a routine from the over-suspicious bosses would be locked to prevent the workers from stealing or committing other crimes. In the case of the fire, the locked doors prevented the workers from escaping the wretched flames. Skeletons were found piled in front of doors, proof of futile attempts at escape. The doors, as a routine from the over-suspicious bosses, would be locked to prevent the workers from stealing or committing other crimes. In the case of the fire, the locked doors prevented the workers from escaping the wretched flames. Skeletons were found piled in front of doors, proof of futile attempts at escape. Outside, panic formed a crowd on the sidewalks. Bystanders watched in terror as huge puffs of smoke rose from the factory building. A laborer paused near the Green Street entrance and heard the sound of a window bursting from high above. As the fire stations were contacted, bystanders craned their necks to catch a glimpse of the burning building. They soon noticed something large and dark fall from the windows. Someone's in there, all right, said one of the onlookers. He's trying to save his best cloth. It didn't take long for the bystanders to realize it wasn't cloth falling from the building, but people. Ladders from the fire stations didn't reach the top floors of the building. They stopped at just six floors high. Hoses from the fire department didn't reach the fire on the top floors either. With no other choice, the desperate workers inside the building jumped to their death. Nets from the fire department weren't strong enough to stop their falls. They shrieked and tumbled as they fell to the pavement, hitting lights and being impaled on fences. Burned bodies jumped from the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors down to the cold ground below. Francis Perkins, a young workers' rights advocate and later a part of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's cabinet, was visiting her friend on that day. They had just settled down to chat when the loud sound of fire engines screamed past them. Bewildered, Miss Perkins looked up and saw smoke rising from behind the New York University building. The top three floors of the building at the corner of Washington Place and Green Street had caught a flame. Smoke poured from the windows, and as Perkins and her friend came closer, so did others. Workers were jumping from the windows in a desperate attempt to escape from the inferno. We got there just as they started to jump, Perkins recalled. I shall never forget the frozen horror which came over us as we stood with our hands on our throats, watching that horrible sight, knowing that there was no help. The firemen kept shouting for them not to jump, but they had no choice. The flames were right behind them. In the weeks that followed this tragic event, grief lingered in the city as many knew the fire could have been prevented and loved ones could still have their lives. On April 5th, 11 days after the tragedy, 100,000 people marched through the city of New York to show their grief and support. Shortly before, an assembly of leaders formed the Committee on Safety to urge the state government to do an investigation. They earned the support of party leaders Al Smith and Robert Wagner, which led to the passing of the law creating the Factory Investigating Commission. This was the most extensive and thorough research yet that looked into fire hazards, unsanitary conditions, occupational diseases, and factory inspections. Even though Harris and Blanc were not convicted of major wrongdoing, the new commission was very effective in improving workers' health on the state level. For example, it established the Municipal Building Code, which would require items such as fire extinguishers, fire alarms, and hoses. They also prohibited smoking in factories. By 1915, 36 similar laws were put forth by the New York State Legislature. However, no substantial national headway was made until the 1930s under Roosevelt. The Wagner Act, National Labor Relations Board, and Fair Labor Standards Act, parts of the New Deal, benefited unions and children, set minimum wage and maximum work hours, and ensured enforcement of these regulations. This triumph came about because of the tragedy of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Although devastating, it brought people together to make change and bring about new codes and laws, all of which were meant to create a healthier and safer work environment for the entirety of factory workers.